Welcome to Concept 4 Notes. We are going to dive deeper into covalent bonds, which you were already introduced to in Concept 1, Intro to Bonding. But now we're going to learn how to name them and write the chemical formulas and all that jazz, just like we did for ionic. So just a reminder, covalent compounds, which are also referred to as molecular compounds, since covalent compounds make molecules, are they are just a compound formed when two or more atoms are sharing electrons and they form between non-metallic elements. Now, remember bonding is a spectrum and we know if something's gonna be more ionic or covalent based on the difference in electronegativity, the delta E N between two different elements. And covalent kind of has this wide range because they can be the bond can be a nonpolar covalent bond or it can be a polar covalent bond. So if the difference in electronegativity between two atoms um, exists, like if there's one at all, then that means that the bond is a polar covalent bond um, because the electrons then are unequally shared. One of them has more of a pull, a greater attraction on the electrons, so it's going to pull the electrons their direction. So for example, look at water right here. It's um, two hydrogens, which are these blue atoms here, and one oxygen. And oxygen has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So oxygen is going to pull the electrons a little bit more. They're still going to share them, but it's going to pull them a little bit harder, attract them more than the hydrogens. And so we use these little deltas and the positive and negative to indicate the partial charges, the poles within this compound. Overall, this molecule is neutral and it's not an ionic compound. It doesn't have like a positive ion and a negative. It just means that this side is a little bit more positive and this side is a little bit more negative. Now this is different than when the difference in electronegativity is zero. That is uh, indicates a pure nonpolar covalent bond because the electrons are equally shared. And so here's an example between two oxygen um, atoms that make O2. Notice we have none of the deltas, none of the partial charges, none of the poles indicated because there aren't poles. They would share these perfectly equally because neither one would have a stronger attraction of the E. So they're sharing those electrons fully. A reminder that the term molecule is specific to covalent compounds. It is a neutral group of atoms that are held together by covalent bonds. And a single molecule is an individual unit. It exists on its own. We can look at just one of them at a time. So for example, here's a picture of one glucose molecule, C6H12O6. Here's a picture of one water molecule, H2O. These are both molecules. And this molecular formula is its chemical formula um, in these covalent compounds. Now, over here though, look at sodium chloride or table salt, NaCl. Notice I did not outline in purple because it is not a molecule. Also notice that I'm not just looking at, you know, one Na and, or, you know, and one Cl. I'm looking at this entire crystal structure that forms in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the NaCl indicates that there's one sodium for every one chlorine. Okay, whereas with covalent compounds, we can really just look for at one individual molecule at a time, which is unique. A term to know with covalent compounds is diatomic elements. This is when two atoms of the same element exist naturally as a molecule. So the ones that you'll need to know would be hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, or iodine or iodine. They don't exist on their own. Like when you're inhaling oxygen right now, you're inhaling O2. You're not just inhaling O. So they exist like this. And because it's two of the same bonded together, these are always forming nonpolar covalent bonds. They're equally sharing those electrons. Now, in terms of stability, covalent compounds tend to still follow the octet rule of desiring eight to get those full outer energy levels of electrons. And when we see when they share electrons and they form bonds, they can do, you know, three things. They can make a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. So in a single bond, they're going to share two electrons. Uh, an example would be what we see in um, hydrogen, H2. So there's two hydrogen atoms. They're going to share that, and so it would form this bond. That one dash represents two electrons shared. Another example we could see is water. So we've got two hydrogen at, um, atoms, one oxygen per the chemical formula. Those will share and those will share. Um, and now notice that's one oxygen and one bond to one hydrogen, one bond to another. So these are single bonds sharing two electrons each. So 
oxygen here has two lone pairs of electrons and two bonding pairs of electrons. But they can also form double bonds, which is where you're going to share four electrons between two different atoms. So looking at O2, we draw the Lewis structures for each of those atoms, which we've done also in our activity at the beginning of this unit. Those would share and those would share. So that's going to form a double bond between these two oxygen atoms, two dashes representing four electrons shared. We see this similarly in carbon dioxide. So um, you have one carbon and two oxygens. And now you may be thinking, how did I know to put carbon in the middle? So the least electronegative atom always goes in the middle with the exception of hydrogen, which is never in the middle. So carbon has a lower electronegativity than oxygen, so it's going to go in the middle. So it's going to share two electrons with this atom and two electrons with this atom, which makes four total on either side. So we end up with these double bonds on either side, a double bond with this oxygen and double bond with this oxygen. And here carbon has no lone pairs. It only has bonding pairs, um, which is interesting. And then a triple bond is just going to be six electrons are shared. So we see this when we look at N2. So they share one pair, two pairs, three pairs. That's six electrons total. And we get that triple bond there. Now something I want to introduce you to is Vesper theory. We're going to talk way more about this in concept five. But you may have noticed when I did some of those drawings, like with the water, I went ahead and like drew them on an angle. Or when I drew, you know, nitrogen in two, I drew it not at an angle. And that was intentional because I was anticipating what we're going to learn about a little bit later, which is these Lewis structures are great, but they don't show the three-dimensional shape of these molecules. They're just showing a 2D shape. And so I try to do my best when I'm drawing them to represent that three-dimensional shape because of Vesper. So the Vesper theory, which is also known as the electron domain theory, um, or Vesper just stands for the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So Vesper is a little bit easier to say. It's just the tendency for electron pairs to be as far apart from one another as possible. And why do they do that? Because the valence electrons are repulsed by each other. Remember, like charges repel. So they don't want to be near each other. So when we draw this, we're not going to draw these electrons right here over here because they don't want to be this close to all these electrons. They all want to be as far apart as possible. Same here. We're not going to draw the hydrogens off to the side here right next to these other oxygens because they're going to want to be away from them. And then we see that here. So whenever you're drawing these, I'm not going to expect you to do these perfectly at all. We will learn more about this and this three-dimensional shape, this molecular geometry um, in concept five. But I do want you just to consider as you're drawing, how can I space these out as much as possible when I'm drawing these? Okay, so we're going to pause and I want you to try to draw the three Lewis structures you see here. And for the sake of the video, we're going to move on and talk about naming. So let's learn the naming, naming rules for covalent. I think covalent are easier. That's why we started with ionic. I think these are a lot, a lot easier. So first, let's start with the formula and then getting the name. So what you do is you'll name the first element. And what's unique about covalent is there's no charges with the ions. And so the subscript tells you how many there are. And so we need to have a prefix to notate how many there would be so we can go the other direction. So we use a prefix. And prefixes are these. 1 is mono, 2 di, 3 tri, 4 tetra, etc. And I will give you these in a reference sheet to use on any quiz or test. Now, the only exception is we don't use mono for 1 on the first element. So if there's only 1 of the first element, we just say what it is, carbon or nitrogen or whatever. The second element, we're going to name it with a prefix to indicate how many there are. And then um, we'll add an IDE ending. So that's it. All right, so let's do an example. P2O5. So name the first element, that's phosphorus, but use a prefix to show how many there are. So there are two phosphorus, so we would say diphosphorus. And then now the second one, name the second element, that's oxygen. It needs a prefix for how many, so five, so penta oxygen. But we also need an IDE ending, so penta oxide, diphosphorus pentoxide. Okay, it'll make you sound, you'll feel really smart when you're saying these chemical names because they are long and funny. All right, so now take a minute and try to name these molecular compounds. I'm going to skip over the answers so you don't see those. We'll do a little practice in class. And now let's talk about how to go the other direction. So how to determine the chemical formula for a covalent compound from a name. 
So the prefixes determine the subscripts. We need those prefixes again. A few notes to notice. If there's not a prefix, you assume that means one. And we do not simplify. Okay, that's it. We don't simplify because remember, this isn't a ratio like we saw in Ionic. What it says is how many there actually are. So P2O5, there are two phosphorus, there are five oxygens, period. Okay, so let's go the other direction. What is the chemical formula for dichlorine monoxide? So di means two, so that means there's two chlorines. Monoxide means there's one oxygen. So Cl2O, that's it. I mean, these really are the simplest ones. So we're going to just do more practice. And we're going to get really, really good at these, I promise you.